this is Matt with Mel Express Radio. I have with me the legendary Paige Hamilton of Helmet. How are you today, man? Hey, I'm doing well, sir. How are you? Good. Thanks again. Great to have you. So, first question I have for you, the band's first ever live album, Live and Rare, was released November 26. What kind of feedback have you received? Oh, I'm, I'm surprised that I'm doing so many interviews, because, uh, you know, I, they were just old chestnuts we had laying around, tapes that we that we baked to get material off, so it's been pretty cool. I mean, people, uh, I think it's for fans, you know what I mean? If somebody's never heard of us before, it's pretty raw to, to you know, have the first thing you hear be a live show from CBGB's, you know, in the first year of the band's existence but uh fans and fans and my students that i give guitar lessons you know they've been stoked so thinking back what do you remember uh, the most about these shows that were um made for the live album or appear in the live album well um you know i, I wrote liner notes on the uh, that on the back of the vinyl and cds I, I assume i don't even know the formats they're released in but uh the cds was just i mean it was CBGBs, you know, and, and that was everybody's goal in New York when you had a band, you wanted to play CBs. It's, they, they had, you know, notoriously great sound system, funky angled stage, you know, awful bathrooms, and, uh, you know, you'd get, like, I think, uh, a discount on, on a beer. You wouldn't get free beer, whatever. But it was, um, you know, Louise Parnassa and, and Hilly Crystal, the two, you know, the owner and the manager. Booker were great people who I got to know through uh, over the years and um, you know it was just really fun I remember going in we had a demo tape and Louise was like ah you know really busy I might listen to it in a couple of weeks if you want to play just do just audition and I said well when's audition night she said the next one was I think Sunday or Monday I think so I said yeah book us and we did it and, um, and they, uh, Mike Kirkland and Tommy Victor from Prong worked the door in front of house and they said this band's awesome book them you know, and so we started literally playing there. It felt like every month or six weeks or so, and uh, just kind of built our following. So we owe a lot to them, you know, and it made us a better band. And then we started touring and stuff. So it was fun. The Big Day Out show was our first time in Australia, um, which was uh, over the top because you come from New York City in January, freezing your ass off, and you get to Australia and it's top with beaches and, you know, Coopers because it's, it's middle of summer, you know. And, uh, it was great, man. I, mean, I think we partied a little too hard. It was also kind of the beginning of the end of our relationship with Peter. Um, things were had kind of been going sour. Um, and he was, you know, we got the impression that he was disgusted with us because we were having so much fun. <laughs> I was, he's from there. He's from Brisbane. He and I are friendly now. Everything's cool. I didn't see water under the bridge. You know, I love it. it was, you know, it was my dear friend for years. Um, but it, that, that just was time for a change. So that was uh, it was pre Betty. Um, all the songs I believe for from Meantime or Strap It On. I'm pretty sure on the on this on the sh- on the, the live album. I can't remember. Um, the CD show was before Strap It On because we I hadn't written a couple of the songs yet. So we, you know, um, yeah, just good good time, man. Really fun. And thinking back, how was it? playing a, a big open air festival versus playing a small club like CBGB's? Well, I mean, I'm always going to favor a small club. Um, that's just me personally. I know, you know, some bands don't have that the luxury of being able to play small clubs because they're too big. We were just about to play two soccer stadium shows in System of a Down and Corn, Russian Circle. And um, they have to play big venues because they're huge. You know, we don't. We, like, we, I'm happy in a 200 seat club and we might play a 1,000 seat club in London. And, you know, I think in New York would do two nights at Bowery, which would be probably a total of 1,500 people all together, I don't know. So I like that intimate, you know, environment, intimate setting when the fans are right there. I don't like barricades. I always have requests for the barricade to be removed. Um, some places legally don't want to do that. So, uh, but I, in a festival, you know, I mean, I swear, like, you you feel like you're a mile away from people, you know, it's you're up on a stage that's, you know, what, 25 feet high, and then there might be big, you know, uh, you know, bass monitor wedges down in front, and then there's a, a you know, a moat, and then there's a, you know, a barricade, and there are the people. So it's, you don't have, it's not as personal, and Helmet is very, you know, much sort of like about, I like sound pressure. I like filling the room with sound and, you know, open air festivals are a very different thing. It's, it's, 
you know, I, I, I like things about festivals. You know, you get to see friends in, in bands because a lot of our friends play the same festivals. And over the 30 years that I've been doing this, 30, well, how many, 32 years now. Uh, but I'm always going to prefer a club. You know, for me, the ideal size is like Hombert, you know, seven, 800 people. That's really fun, you know. And going back to the band's history, especially the past few years, there's been a couple tours where you played Meantime and Betty in its entirety. Would you see any other album that the band would want to play in its entirety coming up? Or I don't know. You know, I, get, I got asked that. Somebody asked me if we do a Meantime 30th. And I'm like, no, nah, we did a 20th. I'm not going to do a 30th. Um, we did uh, the Betty 20th, I believe, as well. And um, I thought about uh, maybe doing an Aftertaste 30th. You know, that would be it. Uh, what is it here? It came out in 97, so that's a possibility, you know. Um, I think, you know, people would like it to the last album with the original rhythm section, John and Henry. Um, and I, I love the album. I had a great time. I learned a lot from Dave Sardi and Greg Gordon, the engineer, um, you know, that I've applied to my producing, you know, for, for years now. And, and they made me a better writer and a better producer, better singer, you know. So I have really fond memories of that album. Um, and uh, I love both those guys too, Sardi and Gordon. What do you see as far for the plans for the band with uh, 2022 coming up? Well, we're going we're, we're gonna to leave in March, and our, our home in Europe is our home base is Prague and the Czech Republic. So we, we have to restore our gear, rehearse, and everything. So we'll go there and, and prepare for this covers tour. So we, we're, we have to learn these cover songs. We released uh, Move On, um, I think in August or something like that, the, the little four, seven inch song uh, box set. And um, it, the manager came up with the idea, and people love it. You know, just do it like, like the focus of the set will be covers and then we'll play, you know, the, I, I call them all the old figs or the old, the old their chestnuts, all the songs from the last, my guys know 90 songs, so um, it's, it'll be fun. It's a fun challenge. You have to try to, try to learn how to, yeah, how to pull off, you know, David Bowie move on with four guys live, you know. No, thank God all, all three of them sing and are really great players. So um, that, that's the next thing. Then we, then we come back and I think it's... Uh, May and then late May June we do we have a U.S. tour and then we're gonna take a, we're gonna take July off or the first two weeks anyway and then do another U.S. run and probably go back and then I I, I started writing songs for an al- a new album it's I want to do a new uh, another helmet album so um, that's kind of my goal you know the 2022 we'll see hopefully fingers crossed I have a piece I'm writing for the Christian Brothers High School in Memphis it's the 150th anniversary that I have to have done by the end of 2022. So that's kind of, that's high on my uh, a list of priorities. You know, as soon as I, I get through the holidays, I have some jazz, little jazz fun gigs in uh, New York um, over Christmas. So I'm heading out there for the holidays. So um, when I get back, I kind of have to put the pedal to the metal. And uh, you yourself actually played in, uh, in the David, David Bowie band at one point, right? I did, yeah. I played the guitar on the Hours uh, promotional tour. It wasn't a full blown tour. We did probably a dozen live shows and then a, you know maybe a dozen TV shows, something like that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it was really fun. It was really cool. Yeah, I got still have you know I got this guitar um, from Patrick Angle, this amazing Fred King. Um, this is one of my guitars I got for that Bowie tour, and I love it. It's Karina. No kidding. It's really really an amazing instrument. I had two of them, but I sold one because this was the good one. Um, so um, that's that's fun. I use it all the time. I keep it tuned to uh, half step down. So if I have to figure out any Hendrix or Stevie Ray Vaughan licks, I can just pick that up. <laughs> And being a band like Helmet, I mean, throughout the years, you've taken up bands like Prong, uh, you've toured with Crowbar, St. Vitus, you did have some shows with Corn lined up, but at the same time, you can play a festival like the Warp Tour or play with a band like Sick of It All. How has it been just touring with and taking out so many diverse acts? Yeah, you know, like, I feel like when, because the music was uh, a new thing, you know, in late 80s, late 80s, early 90s, there were a lot of different music was very rock music, indie rock, whatever you want to call it, was very diverse, you know, and, and things weren't so, 
you know, broken down into little categories and subcategories that know we're thrash metal, know we're death metal, know we're, you know, alternative metal, know we're industrial metal, know we're whatever. And I just never gave a shit about any of that. I, I really honestly don't care. I mean, the only use is if I want to go to the record store and buy something, uh, you know, I can go to that section and find, you know, classical, classical music. We know what that is. Basically, it's orchestral or chamber music using strings and woodwinds and brass and, you know, and, and you know, jazz. What's jazz? You know, it's usually a, con- you know, a combo of three, three to 30 musicians playing music that swings and has co- more complex chord changes than rock. You know, it's, it's it, I, I never consider us anything. Well, you know, any, any genre. Like, we got a Grammy nomination as metal performance, but then I heard we were post hardcore. You know, before that, we were alternative because uh, we were on, like, on college radio stations before there was, you know, before alternative became, you know, some cookie cutter, you know, specific thing. You know, so you say indie. Indie pop now, you cringe. Indie rock, oh god, that's like pretentious shoegazer crap, you know. And and that's not what we are. So you know, it's we uh, yesterday I did an interview with the guys like you guys are ultimate punk rockers because you don't you don't fit in anywhere. And we played metal festivals with Motley Crue and Kiss and Sabbath and you know Manson. We've played the as you said I mentioned the Warp Tour and uh, that Warp Tour was a little more specific to me. There was the ska punk, uh, screamo emo kind of thing. That was the bulk of the bands. We didn't fit in at all. And some of the people were just like, what the hell is this? Other people were like, what the hell is this? You know, my friend Sarah Bear, who worked for Kevin Lyman at the time, said she stood out in the audience a few times and she loved seeing like 16 year olds going like, you know, discovering us for the first time and being really excited, you know, and that, that to me is cool. That's why we'll play with anyone, anywhere, anytime. You know, I don't care. I, I don't expect everyone on planet earth to love us. And I never did. You know what I mean? And that's not, that was never my goal to starting a band. You know, it stands to reason if you write, play music you're proud of and you're honest and you like that some people are going to dig it. Some people won't, you know, <laughs> And with the year almost over, what have been some of your favorite records of 2021? Uh, <laughs> I just get asked this and people are like, um, God, you know, the uh, Love Supreme, John Coltrane, uh, live in Seattle came out a couple of weeks ago. My friend Mike Watts sent it to me, the legendary bassist from the Minutemen, and, uh, you know, the amazing guy. And uh, he and I have a Co- uh, Coltrane obsession and uh that's the best album nothing's gonna beat that i mean that's just incredible it's, it's coltrane you know playing love supreme live in 1960 god i can't remember was it 65 okay that album came out 64 i forget something like that but um as far as any new bands i can't think of i can't even think of what i've listened to on my flight i listened to uh what did I listen to? I listened to a classical guy named Ray Vaughn Williams, an English composer I love, and I listen to. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Beatles because of the, doc, the documentary came out, and that's a, a, a incredible documentary. It's been so uh, inc- just such a gift, like to after fifty years to be able to watch them work and see how these four amazing you know uh, musicians put their music together and how they interacted and and um, that was that's been my favorite thing so you know over the last thanksgiving morning i was up at the crack of dawn and firing it up on my ipad i was at my brother's and he and his family would not have been into it so i put my headphones on and well, you know we'll, we'll go 5 a.m the next day to get the next episode <laughs> i'm an obsessive beatles fan and I think any musician is probably an obsessive Beatles fan. <laughs> is there anything that we've gone over that we haven't gone over that you would like to throw in? Can't think of much. I mean, I did an album with my friends. My old, uh, I played in a band in the '80s in Brooklyn, and uh, uh, we we got together and put out an album uh, called Malumbo and Paige Hamilton. Um, Fairy Tale Aliens is the title. That was pretty fun. A uh, fun time. A lot of work. We were slated to do an album release show um, in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. So I was in New York and I turned around and came home because it looked uh, it was it looked like it was going to be worse than we had all. Anticipated, so um, yeah, that that, um, that was fun. I'm trying to think what else. I've been producing some stuff. Got the Christian Brothers piece to finish. 
um, and helmet songs, and then I'm still, you know, that's that's kind of all I can think of, <laughs> producing things and writing, so, and try, trying to play jazz. <laughs> if you could recommend one helmet album to someone that's unfamiliar with the band, what would it be? Uh, I'd be Dead to the World. That's my favorite album. Um, I'm really proud of it. I feel like I feel like it's got everything that I that I envisioned. You know, like song that like lyrically and musically and uh, sonically. I love um, I love the work that everyone did on it. You know, Toshi and, and I love Jay Baumgartner's mixing. It's incredible. Um, I love uh, 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 you know Howie Weinstein mastered it. He's uh, he's incredible. Um, and I love my bandmates for stepping up and kicking ass. You know, Dan and Dan Beeman and Kyle Stevenson and Dave Case are just three incredibly underrated musicians that I'm sort of fortunate to get to, you know, to play my music, you know, my songs. So, um, yeah, that to me is like, you get, you get the heavy stuff, you get the rhythmic weird weirdness where there might be like a groove that's in six against four, you know, and, or in seven against four, you know, it's just song seven, you know, I Heart My Guru. And, and I just feel like I, my arranging and my writing and my singing has progressed over all these years that I just feel like it's a great culmination of everything that I've that's led up to that. It's, there are, all the albums are interesting, you know, from the, the developmental standpoint, I did an interview earlier and the guy was saying, amazing to hear the live album you know year one like the kind of noisy hardcore you know intense you know spilling over the sides um, you know of the Super Bowl and then you know in, a, in two years how much tighter we'd gotten and, and you know by the time we were playing in um, uh, Australia you know the, so the meantime stuff so those I think strap you know strap it on in meantime they're you know they're to quote Bill, Bill Murray their baby steps and it, it, it's you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater but you progress with each album you hope and expand your vocabulary like harmonically and rhythmically and your singing and your lyrics and that's so but uh yeah so i really i really like the last album a lot i love playing red scare it's one of my favorite songs i've ever written and uh, i heart my guru is another favorite of mine i love they're really fun to play uh, life or death too you know um uh, yeah just fun fun stuff to play live so i really like playing well you know um, welcome to algiers uh, um, off um seeing eye dog there's some stuff on there that's a lot of fun to play too you know because that, that kind of led to but that has some more issues tech technically and and uh i love playing white city that's a cool song but i, I you know there were some sonic things that i that that i didn't love you know um i think the songs turned out great and the, you know but i just sonically i thought some of the guitars you know could get a little got a little grainy in, in places now, my last question I have for you, going back to 1989, I mean, we're going over 30 years of Helmet being a band, and especially with you being the driving force, what has just been the key to you keeping Helmet going for over 30 years? People, um, fortunately, are still uh, listening and, 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 and discovering and rediscovering, and I've, had, I've been so, uh, so fortunate to have meet so many guys in bands from... You know, uh, uh, dime, you know, dime bag and Pantera to you know the guys in Mastodon, guys in System of a Down, stuff that have been super complimentary. Deftones, Chino, and you know, said really kind things to me about how um, uh, you know our music has you know been important to them and influenced them. And that's I think because we never did it to to fit into any specific genre, and we did we weren't doing it for a purpose other than to play music that we love. And I think you know it's it's. If a band becomes disingenuous and they're doing something because they think it's the right thing to do, or it's a, or it's a marketing concept, or it's whatever, then it you know they, you can lose the plot a little bit. It's still about picking up your instrument and singing and playing. And I love that's still the joy in my day. You know, it's still a favorite part of my life. And um, so the fact that we get to you know play in sixty countries, you know. Uh, over the course of our, you know, my, my time in, in this band and, um, and we still get, you know, we have a, a two month tour in Europe and then we'll go back to Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and then back to South America and then to the U S we're still able to go perform. I, I have, I love it. I've said this, I never took it for granted. I never have, 
but the pandemic is really taking taken away a huge part of my my life, my heart, my soul, what I live for. Really, my favorite place in Earth, on Earth, is on stage with my you know my mics, my pedals, my amps, my guitars, and then you know being able to step up and sing and play. It's just there's something about it. I, it feels like it's you're you're transported just to another another place it's not like the real world which the real world is can be pretty depressing sometimes you know and human beings are i remember listening to a great bill burr interview i believe it was jenny kimmel and he said he's toured seven out of the last eight weeks and he said you know 85 percent of the country people are cool man like yeah, I feel the same when we tour. You know, I go out there and you see, he said it's the extreme right and the extreme left that are fucking everything up. And he said, he said, oh, mommy and daddy, you're fighting about a gender neutral bathroom where I can hang my AR-15. I was like, this is so spot on. It's like, it's like, just shut the fuck up, man. Like, you know, like shut the fuck up and love your fellow human beings. Let's, we, let's get along, man. Let's get along. It's really not that I, you know, I dated a, you know, Israeli girl and an Arab girl. You know what I mean? I mean it's, it's like, it's, it, it doesn't, we're just human beings. You know, we're all essentially the same. And, I, and you know, race, religion, sexual orientation, you know, whatever it is, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, we're compassionate. That's something that in touring has been a gift for, for me to get to spend 35 years because I toured in Van Susan's before this and I toured with Clint Branca, did shows in Europe and stuff and meeting people of all walks of life all over the world and that's, you know, it's, it's not just about, you know, this country and then this state and then this county and then this city and we hate you because you're in the neighboring county and I was like, come on, man knock it off like we're all you know it's the human race it really is bob marley was right you know so it's like one love come on so i i believe that in my heart and i know that bill burr was right like you know 85 percent of people are are cool and you're gonna be cool even if you disagree with them politically you know i have people in my life that i disagree with I was. I grew up in a family of a Republican mother and father, and a Republican younger brother and sister. All four of them. I'm the only lefty in the family. They give me shit for years and years and years. But we didn't fight. We didn't. You know. It was like I understand where they were coming from. You know, and they understood where I'm coming from. You know. So this. You know, it's this divisive sort of tone is not. It's something that is. You know, we got to continue to you know, fight to, to dispel that, you know, that kind of anger and hatred and, and, you know, and just the truth is the truth, man. It's like, you know, 700,000 people are dead from, from this, you know, and that's, there's, as, as Jen Psaki, the, you know, White House spokesperson said, it's like the, the virus doesn't, it sees no borders or political, you know, affiliations. Mm. It's going to kill whoever it's going to get into, you know, so... Yeah. That's about all the question I got for you. It was great talking to you. Thank you for your time. Stay safe and healthy. My, my pleasure. You too, sir. See you. Bye, man.